All right, the Bible in seven passages. Uh, this is lesson number three in the series. However, we are discussing passage number two uh, in the seven passages, the second of the, second of the seven passages, and this is part two. Uh, hopefully you've got all of that. Part two of the second passage, all right? So that'll be Genesis chapter three, verses um, seven to 24, and the title of this particular lesson, God's Promise to Fallen Man. So we continue with our series where we are examining seven Bible passages that attempt to summarize the information contained in all 66 books uh, of the Bible. Now, in, previous, uh, in our previous lesson, we looked at the second of the seven passages, Genesis chapter three, verses one to 24, and we noted that this scripture revealed the cause for the fallen condition of mankind uh, and the creation. And so in Genesis three, verses one to six, that was the last lesson, the Bible describes how Eve succumbed to temptation and disobeyed God's command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The result of this sin was Adam and Eve's separation from God and eventual death, as well as the decline and destruction of the creation, which would be fully destroyed by the worldwide flood in Noah's day. So uh, we have to, you know, we left at a dark spot, but not all is darkness, however. In Genesis 3, the same passage, but in verses 7 to 24, we read that God makes a promise to destroy the source of sin and evil in the world, but first, but first come the consequences, the consequences of sin, and that's what Genesis 3, verses 7 to 24 begins to talk about. So Genesis records in sequence the consequences and events that took place after the disobedience of uh, Adam and Eve. First of all, shame. Chapter three, uh, Genesis, verse 7a, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. So they knew from experience, they tasted the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They had experienced good, and now they were experiencing evil. Their experience was the shame that comes from knowingly disobeying God. Now, some ask, why was their nakedness the focal point of their shame? Their sin was not a sexual one, and I've heard all kinds of stories, you know, people trying to uh, explain this passage, and, Actual doctrines that say, oh, the sin was that they had sex. No. <laughs> Where do you get that from that passage? Where, you know? One idea is that they realized that as head of the human race, they had corrupted the future generation by their sin. And this realization centered itself around their reproductive organs, which symbolized future generations. Another idea is that they realized that they could not hide their sin and their nakedness was a reminder of this truth. Either way, the Bible says that they felt embarrassment and shame for having done wrong. Another consequence of sin, guilt. Genesis 3, 7b, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The fact that they tried to cover themselves means that they felt guilty. Isn't that what we do when we feel guilty about something? We try to cover ourselves. We try to make excuses. They knew that they had done wrong and they felt bad about it, which is probably what saved them. Had they been proud like Satan, God could have destroyed them there and then. That would have been the end of it. Note that they tried to cover themselves and this is always inadequate. They tried to cover themselves. They covered themselves, but they were still afraid. When God covers you, you don't have to be afraid anymore. 
that echoes the prayer that Brother Coyle made this morning. His request to God that we feel the comfort, that we feel the security that comes from knowing that we are children of God. Another consequence of sin, fear. Fear, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Shame and guilt produce fear. Fear because, because a feature of man's conscience where the will operates, a feature of that is that man intuitively knows that sin equals punishment. Even little kids know if they, you know, the mommy said don't, don't eat the cookie before supper and they eat the cookie, you know, and mom says, what happened to the cookie? You know, whoops. We know intuitively that disobedience bring some kind of punishment. <coughs> now God had said to them that disobedience would bring death and that knowledge is part of man's psyche. Paul the apostle talks about that in Romans chapter one verse 28. Now the normal fellowship between Adam and God did not include sin. Adam knows God's will concerning sin and consequently he's afraid of the judgment that he knows is going to come. He was not afraid because of his physical nakedness. He was afraid because his nakedness now reminded him of sin and sin reminded him of death. The promise that God made that if they sinned they would die. Another consequence of sin more sin, <laughs> more sin. Genesis 3, 11 to 13, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now it doesn't take long for sin to multiply itself. Immediately, Adam begins to show signs of his moral deterioration. When asked about the tree, instead of confessing and asking for forgiveness, Adam does two things. Number one, he blames his wife and he blames God. Instead of praising God for his goodness, he blames him for his troubles, imagine. When posed with the same question, Eve does not acknowledge guilt and ask for forgiveness either. She blames the serpent and offers the excuse that she was deceived. It's not my fault, he fooled me. So sin has already reduced them to denying their own guilt and blinded them to God's goodness. They don't appeal to Him for help. This would have been the right place here to say, we know you told us not to do this. And I don't know why, but we went ahead and did it and now help us, how, how can, you know, we're sorry, anything. But no. And then of course, one other consequence of sin, judgment. There's always judgment. There's always judgment. The first thing they learn about evil is that it always results in judgment and punishment by God. God pronounces judgment in the same order that the sin proceeded. It started with Satan, who deceived Eve, and then Adam. And so the judgment follows that order. So in the first place, Satan is judged. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. 
And so the snake's posture, I mean, whatever it may have been before, will now be that of one slithering in the dust, trampled underfoot of other animals. This is the imagery of the position of Satan who once was an angel. Now he'll be hated, cause fear and repulsion as the snake now does in normal circumstances. You know, you're walking along on a nice summer day and all of a sudden a snake slithers right in front of you. What is your first reaction? Oh, cutie, come here, baby. That's not what you do, right? You go, oh. <laughs> First reaction, it's almost like it's hardwired into us. Ooh, unless you're a snake hunter, but that's a whole other psychological issue, so <laughs> we won't go there. We get a glimpse of Satan's original plan when we hear the curse. There is special emphasis on Satan's inability from here forward to dominate woman and the offspring she will bear which was probably the reason why he attacked her in the first place, in order to dominate her and control her children for his own purposes. God says that there will be war, not subjection, war between the woman, her children, and Satan. This struggle will end with the seed of woman destroying the seed of Satan. It's interesting to note that in the Bible, men are the ones who have the seed, not women. And spirit beings have no seed. Spirits do not procreate, only humans do this. The seed of woman, of course, is Jesus, who was conceived without a human male. That's how the reference fits. The seed of Satan is the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, to whom Satan gives power and who will be destroyed by Christ's coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. The bruising is a blow. For the woman's seed, the blow, the passage tells us, the blow will be on the heel, which is the inferior part of the body. This is Satan's attack that resulted in the human death of Christ that was only temporary. For Satan's seed, however, the blow is to be to his head, which is the superior part of the body and thus fatal. Amazing how in just you know, two verses, the Bible encapsulates the entire struggle between Satan and mankind and how it will end. Jesus, when he returns, destroys death and pronounces judgment on Satan who will be thrown into the pit forever. This is the promise, not just that Satan will be destroyed, but all the things that Satan brings with him, ultimately death. Now remember this passage, one of the reasons I chose this passage as one of the seven. In here you have the promise. The promise that, you know, like a golden line that, that will just go through the entire scriptures that ultimately is fulfilled by Jesus. And it's, a, it's a providential, let's just say, that uh, we are talking about the promise here on Easter Sunday, because that's what the promise is. Death will be defeated. And of course, we know that death is defeated because we see the defeat of death through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's the, that's the judgment on Satan. Event, you, will not subject, you will not subject woman to your domination. Her seed will not be totally in subjection to you. And eventually her seed, Jesus, uh, uh, will receive a blow from you, but it won't, it'll only be temporary. But he will you know, execute a blow on you that'll be, that'll be fatal. All right. So there Satan is judged. <clears throat> then Eve is judged. The woman, he said, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So both Adam and Eve were painlessly brought into perfect, a perfect and sinless world. When they were created, there was no pain mentioned. 
Because of this sin, however, the creating of future society would be marked by pain. Because of their sin, death enters the world and pain at childbirth becomes the constant reminder of this fact. Before sin, man and woman enjoyed co-rulership over creation. Because of sin, this perfect balance was upset and God established a rule of law in the area of leadership. The husband, he said, would rule and be the head of the family unit. This concept is repeated and confirmed in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11.3 and Ephesians 5.22 to 24. There have been many abuses, of course, of this situation, but the Bible clarifies the loving relationship that is to exist within the situation of male spiritual leadership in the home and in the church. There is also mercy in God's judgment over Eve. She will not desire the serpent and his promises, but will return her focus to her husband. The pain of childbirth will not overcome her love of husband and family, and there will be a limit to the suffering involved in childbirth. Uh, isn't it amazing? This is talking about something that took place thousands and thousands of years ago. And yet with all the modern medicine and all the advancement in medicine, it still hurts to put a child into the world. Amen, sisters? Yes. It still hurts to put a child into the world. They haven't figured out a way where that can be painlessly done in a natural, in a natural way. The judgment continues, this time to Adam, in verse 17 to 19. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. First, God outlines the sin. Adam listened to his wife. He changed his allegiance. Instead of listening to God's word, he listened to his wife. Loyalty to God's word should be stronger than any human tie, including marriage. Eve did not deceive Adam. She convinced him there's a difference. You know, what harm could it do? Just this once, just to, just to see what it's like. I did it, nothing happened to me. Those could have been some of the arguments. In the end, the plain truth is that Adam did what God said not to do. God then pronounces the judgment on Adam. Since he is the head of the race, the judgment by extension will affect all of his descendants. Because of what he has done, God must now remove himself and this will affect man. I mean, God is holy, sinless, cannot dwell where there is sin and immorality. Until Adam and Eve sinned, God maintained the balance for life in the physical world by his presence. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world where God maintained this perfection through His power. There was no deterioration, there was no overpopulation, there were no imbalances. However, once sin entered the world, God removed His presence and permitted the cycle of deterioration to take place. So this was the reality of good and evil warned against. The deterioration not permitted before was now released. Mutations that caused decay began to form. Even in man, the cycle of deterioration would now cause his physical death. Of course, this was before the great flood. So the rate of decay and the level of imbalance were slow. And this explains why people lived such long lives during that time. However, once the flood destroyed the world, man's lifespan shortened and the rate of decay accelerated. Is there climate change? Well, yeah, there's climate change. It started with the flood. 
It started with the flood and it's continued to this day and it will continue to the end of the world. Nothing new there. Genesis explains the symptoms and features of a declining world where God is no longer extending His power to maintain a steady state of life and order, thus allowing all things to gradually disintegrate towards disorder and death. God did not create death. He merely removed His life-sustaining power and allowed His creation to disintegrate, which is what it would naturally do without His life force that gave existence to it to begin with. This concept you know, of deterioration was universally observed and scientifically formulated about 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, Carnot, Clausens, Kelvin, other scientists. It was called the second law of thermodynamics. In Genesis it's called the, the law of sin and death. Scientists just gave it a you know, scientific turn to it. This law states that all systems, if left to themselves, become degraded or disordered. All systems, whether they be watches or suns, eventually wear out. Even modern scientists are reconfirming this law with newer and newer equipment, the Hubble telescope, for example. Instead of all things being made, you know, organized into complex systems as they were during, during creation week, they are now being unmade, becoming disorganized and simple. This is what is wrong with our world and the reason for its deterioration right here in Genesis. So let's get back to the passage in Genesis and its language. In the, uh, in the judgment against uh, Adam, he says, cursed is the ground. Well, this is, the, this is the reverse of it is very good. You know, God would create something and say, it's good. He'd create something else, it's good. Then he'd create, and he, said, he looked at everything that he had made, he said, this is very good. Now he says, cursed is the ground. The curse is that God now removes his sustaining power. It also says in the passage, for thy sake refers to God's mercy. God removes His sustaining power not only as a response to sin, but also to put a limit on the wickedness resulting from sin. I mean, better suffering and death accompanying sin than unchecked rebellion and never ending multiplication of wicked people using the creation for sinful purposes. I mean, once sin was in, God had to intervene in some way. So the curse on the earth is followed by the result that it would have on man. Cursed is the ground. So what, what happens to man because the ground is cursed by God? Well, there's sorrow, continual disappointment and futility in life, especially in providing for oneself. Yeah, there are good times, but there are also bad times, aren't there? Yes, we're healthy and strong and vigorous and we're building up our homes and families and we're doing all those things. And then one day, you, know, you have a lump on your neck and that bothers you while you're shaving. What's that? You know? And then you go to the doctor, you know the story. Well, that's, that's a, to a tumor and then a biopsy. And then, well, maybe we'll do some surgery. Oh, bad news, we're going to have to take your voice box out. And you happen to be perhaps a salesman or someone that has to use their voice in their work. All of a sudden, you know, the building and the, 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 the looking forward to the future and everything's going to be great. You know, all of a sudden, all that has changed in one, one moment. One moment of sorrow. And there are plenty of those moments in life. Cursed is the ground will result in pain and suffering. This is signified by you know, thorns and thistles. That's life, right? He says hard work. Before, man ate of the abundance of the garden. There was no work. It was a joyful harvesting. Now he would have to scratch a living from an unco uncooperative earth. And then, of course, death. With all of his work and effort, man would, like the rest of the creation, deteriorate into the primary elements from which he was taken, the earth itself. This was the result of the curse on Adam. 
It's interesting to note that Jesus experienced every one of these elements when, as the Bible says, He bore the curse on our behalf. Galatians 3.13. In the same way, Jesus knew He was a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53 verse 3. He wore the curse as a crown of thorns. Mark 15, 17. His work and labor made him sweat, but his sweat came out as drops of blood. Luke 22, 44. And finally, God brought him into the dust of death. Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 22, 15. So God placed the curse on the earth by withdrawing himself and thus allowing the world and mankind to disintegrate into death. However, he did not leave the world without hope. That hope was that one day he would create a new heaven and a new earth which would never be destroyed by sin and where he would dwell eternally with his people. So now that the judgment was pronounced, there was a response from Adam and Eve. They don't say anything here, but they make a response. Let's uh, look at Genesis 3 verse 20. It says, now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all, of all living. There's a lot in this verse. They, they don't say anything, but we see them doing something here. Adam renames his wife. Originally, he had named her woman. This term signifies that she was part of him. She was equal and similar in nature to him. Now he gives her another name that will signify several other things. First of all, the word Eve means life giver. It signified that there were going to, they, the two of them, were going to obey God's command to multiply upon the earth because they could have, you know, it could have been terrible. They could have said, this is too much, I, I can't take it. What do you mean we're out of the garden? What do you mean I'm going to have to work for a living? I can't bang, I'm going to hang myself, I'm going to kill myself. But that's not what they do. They signify, yes, we, we, some of the other commands of God was to go forth and multiply. Okay, we're going to do that. This response also showed that they believed God's promise to bring salvation through the seed of the woman. By bearing children despite pain, woman was expressing her belief that the Savior would ultimately come. God renews his relationship with man, not based on perfection anymore, now based on faith. Because they believe God's promise expressed in their intention to procreate, Adam and Eve are saved. And I firmly believe that one of the reasons we have so much joy when a, new, when a baby is born, it never gets old, does it? Those of us who are grandparents, our children announced, hey, guess what? Mom, dad, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a baby. And whether it's your first grandchild or your 20th one, there's always a great joy, isn't there? And I think it's related to this here. Every baby is a reminder of the promise that God has given us that one day you know, we will all have this new birth and this new life. And so in response to their faith expressed in obedience, God provides a covering for their shame and guilt and nakedness. Remember, they were still trying to hide themselves. So in Genesis 3, <clears throat> excuse me, 21, it says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Note that animals were sacrificed in order to provide this covering. This is the first preview indicating how redemption would ultimately come. The blood of the innocent would cover the sins of the guilty. And then we read, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So man knows experientially both good, that's fellowship with God and perfect creation, as well as evil, separation from God and the punishment associated with evil. They now know the knowledge of good and evil, they now know it. 
This is the reverse of others after him who experienced evil first and then when saved experienced fellowship with God and perfection through faith. We experience the different. We start out evil and then we're saved and we experience the goodness of, of God. They did it in reverse. They began experiencing the goodness of God and then they experienced evil when they, when they uh, disobeyed. Adam is now weakened by sin and although repentant and saved, he can still be tempted to eat of the tree of life. The result being that he would continue to exist in the sin state forever. Perhaps this is what Satan did and why there is no salvation. You ever wonder why is there no salvation for Satan? Maybe this is the reason. And so in the last verses of the passage that we're studying, it says, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So the wording suggests here that Adam was reluctant to leave and so God does two things to guarantee the carrying out of his judgment. He drives, you notice the word, he drives him out. To drive somebody is, come on, go, let's go. You know. He drives the man and his wife out of, out of the garden into their new abode where there will be work and heartache. And he puts two angels and a flaming sword to protect access to the tree of life. The tree is preserved for a future time. The sword signifies that you cannot get to it without physical death. You must go through death to get to the tree of life. The remaining story of the Bible, of course, will describe how God worked in order to bring man to the point where he could again reach out and eat of the tree of life. In Revelation verses 2-7 it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. This is what we look forward to as Christians, to partake once again uh, or to have the opportunity once again to partake of the tree of life and to live forever. But now living forever, this is a good thing. Why? Because sins have been forgiven, because we will be equipped with a new and glorious body and so eternal life is to be desired. All right, so the next lesson we're going to look at the third passage of the seven, uh, where God sets into motion the plan to save mankind from eternal destruction. All right, that's passage number two completed. Five more to go. Thank you for your attention.